I still can't believe it. How could I have let it happen? It was just a regular Wednesday night when my life turned into a waking nightmare, one I couldn't shake off no matter how hard I tried. It started when my beloved dog, Baxter, a golden retriever with the heart of a lion, vanished from our backyard. I had settled down to watch the game, nursing a cold beer after a grueling day at work. Baxter, like always, had gone out to do his nightly rounds around the backyard. I lived out in the sticks, just outside of a small town in Maine, where every house had more land than it knew what to do with. And that night, it felt like there was something else out there, in the darkness beyond our yard, watching. I felt it, but I ignored it. Worst mistake of my life. The game rolled on, and I was sucked into it, oblivious of the passing time. Then I heard it, a high-pitched yelp echoing from outside. A chill ran down my spine. Baxter never made a sound like that. I rushed outside, a sense of dread creeping over me. It was eerily quiet. The backyard was a carpet of darkness, punctuated by the tiny pinpricks of starlight. I called out for Baxter. Nothing. No wagging tail, no excited bark. Just an oppressive silence. I rushed around the yard, a flashlight in hand, the beam dancing over the trees and bushes. Nothing. Then, from the corner of my eye, I saw movement by the old oak tree at the end of our property. I turned, heart pounding in my chest. That's when I saw it. My blood ran cold. It was like nothing I'd ever seen before. It looked like a person, but wrong. So wrong. Hunched and skeletal, its skin was a sickly gray, stretched tight over its bony frame. It had long, ragged claws that glinted in the moonlight. But its eyes, God, its eyes were the worst, glowing with an unholy light. They were fixed on me. In its grip, whimpering softly, was Baxter. I felt like I was trapped in a nightmare, helpless. I yelled, charged at the thing, but with a swift, fluid movement, it turned and leapt over the fence, disappearing into the darkness. My Baxter, taken from me. Anger washed over me, hot and bitter. I knew what had taken Baxter, the creature known in local legends as the Rake. I'd always dismissed the stories as nonsense, tales to keep kids in line. But now, the brutal reality of it stared me in the face. The next morning, I told my story. I was met with hushed silence, then skeptical glances and muted condolences. To them, Baxter was just another pet lost to the wild. But I knew better. I knew what I had seen. I knew what had taken Baxter from me. In the days that followed, I searched for him, trudging through the dense woodland around my property, calling out his name. I found nothing, no sign of Baxter, no sign of the rake. But I felt it, always, the sense of being watched, of a malevolent presence lurking just out of sight. I couldn't just let it go. I couldn't let Baxter's loss be in vain. The town might think I'm crazy, but I don't care. I've started fortifying my home, setting traps in the backyard, keeping watch at night. I won't rest until I've found the rake, until I've made it pay for what it did. My heart aches for Baxter, for the joy and companionship he brought into my life. I miss him more than words can express. I feel a cold, hard rage every time I think of that damned creature. But more than anything, I feel an unshakable determination. I don't know what'll come out of this. Maybe I'll find Baxter. Maybe I'll find that godforsaken creature. But one thing's for sure. I won't back down. Not until I've had my revenge. And so, I'm left with my memories and my resolve. A man alone in the woods, tormented by a beast from a nightmare. I share my story not to frighten you, but as a warning. The rake is real, as real as the pain I feel every day. Keep your pets close. Keep your loved ones closer. And if you see those glowing eyes in the dark, pray to God you're faster than I was. This was emailed to us recently, a digitized diary entry dated back to the 90s. When we read it, it shocked us so much we felt compelled to share this story. We have kept the author's anonymity at their request, but the details are untouched. I've never been one to write a diary, but after the events of the last few days, 
I felt a desperate need to record what happened in case... Well, just in case. You see, my hometown isn't like any other towns. It's been abandoned almost overnight. Imagine waking up and finding your entire world as you know it. Empty. But not just empty. Changed. Morphed into something strange and frightening. It's become a real silent hill. I remember waking up that morning to an unnatural silence. Our town was small, but the usual sounds of life, distant laughter, dogs barking, cars, all gone. I peeked out of my window, expecting to see the Johnson's kids playing in their yard, or old man Tim walking his golden retriever. What greeted me instead was an empty, ghostly street, with a dense fog settling over it. Walking down the deserted street, my heart pounded in my chest. Each step echoed ominously off the buildings. Houses, shops, the school, every building was abandoned. Cars sat unattended in driveways, doors were left ajar, toys scattered on yards. A chilling wind swept past, sending shivers down my spine. The real terror began when I saw the first of the... marks. I'll call them that because I don't know what else to call them. Scrawled across the town's central billboard were large, sprawling symbols, something like a mix between hieroglyphs and graffiti. Unsettling, indecipherable, and somehow filled with a palpable dread. When night fell, things got worse. The power went out, plunging the town into darkness. I tried to leave, but the roads leading out were obscured by that impenetrable fog. And then, I heard them. Faint whispers seemingly carried by the wind. I couldn't make out the words, but the tone, it was pleading, terrified. I holed up in my house, hoping that this was all just a twisted nightmare I'd wake from. But when dawn broke, the town was still deserted, and the whispers had grown louder. Deciding to investigate the source of these sounds, I followed them to the old abandoned factory on the outskirts of town. The whispers seemed to grow louder, and I could finally make out the words. They were begging for help. I stepped inside, my flashlight barely piercing the darkness. In the chilling gloom, the factory was a labyrinth of rusted machinery and broken down assembly lines. Then I saw them, more symbols, eerily glowing on the factory walls. The glow pulsed with a rhythm, like a heartbeat, the room growing brighter then dimmer, each pulse sending waves of fear down my spine. And with every pulse, the whispers grew louder, until they were screaming in my ears, a cacophony of fear and despair. Suddenly, the factory machinery roared to life, the grinding of metal on metal echoing in the eerie silence. I spun around in terror, my flashlight illuminating a tall, grotesque figure emerging from the shadows. Its eyes, those glowing, haunting eyes, stared back at me as it advanced steadily. I ran for my life, the figure's heavy footsteps echoing behind me. I could hear it whispering my name, its voice a guttural growl that froze my blood. I barely made it back home, the whispers and the figure's footsteps echoing in my head long after I'd bolted the door. I'm writing this now, huddled in my home, the only light the glow from these haunting symbols that have appeared on my own walls. The whispers haven't stopped. They're everywhere, outside my home seeping through the cracks, and I can still hear the figure. It's calling my name. It's getting louder now. I fear it's close. I'm writing this as a record, a testimony to what has happened here. If you're reading this, I'm sorry. I have to go. The door. It's starting to creak open. And that's where the diary ends. It's clear something horrifying happened. What we can't tell is what became of the author. We hope to investigate further and bring you more of this chilling tale as it unfolds. There's something about online dating that has always unsettled me, even before the incident. It feels like casting a net in an ocean teeming with life, but the kind of life you can't see until it's up close, and by then, it might be too late. I matched with Sarah on one of those apps. The sort where your opening line could mean a lifetime of connection or a swift trip to the left swipe pile. I knew Sarah was special though, so I dropped the puns and went with sincerity, and that seemed to work. We clicked. 
We had similar interests. Hiking, indie movies, a strange fascination with late 19th century Russian literature. It felt like I'd finally caught a fish that wasn't a boot. Our first couple of dates went well. We laughed a lot, shared stories of our lives, and that connection, that spark, only grew stronger. But then, I started noticing little oddities. Sarah would often glance over her shoulder as if she was being watched. She'd get jumpy at sudden noises. When I asked, she brushed it off as nerves from a bad past relationship. I bought it because, well, we all have our baggage, right? Things escalated on our fifth date. We were at this little Italian place, and Sarah seemed more on edge than usual. Halfway through the meal, she suddenly stood, knocking her chair backward. Her eyes were wide, staring at something or someone at the entrance. He found me, was all she said, before bolting out of the restaurant. I turned around to see a man, about my age, standing in the doorway. His eyes were cold, and there was something about his smirk that sent shivers down my spine. I ran after Sarah, but she was already gone, lost in the city's labyrinth of streets. For days after, my texts and calls went unanswered. I was worried. The man's cold stare was etched in my memory. Then one day, I got a message from her. A single address and a plea. Help me. I was terrified, but I couldn't abandon her. The address led me to a rundown part of the city, an old warehouse district that hadn't seen use in decades. The entire place reeked of abandonment and desolation. As I got closer to the address, I could see a dim light flickering through the windows of one of the warehouses. I wanted to call the police, but Sarah's fear of her pursuer being some sort of powerful, untouchable figure held me back. I decided to peek in first. Creeping to the window, I saw Sarah tied to a chair in the middle of the warehouse. The man from the restaurant was there too, pacing around her, his cruel smirk more unsettling in the dim light. Fear gripped me, but I couldn't run. I had to do something. I fumbled in my pocket for my phone, deciding I had to call the police. Consequences be damned. But as I was about to dial, a hand clamped down on my shoulder. I turned and came face to face with another man, this one as menacing as the one inside. The last thing I remember was the sharp pain as something hard hit the back of my head. I woke up tied next to Sarah. Her face was pale, but her eyes blazed with a defiant fire. The men were talking in hushed tones, but I could hear the chilling words payment and dispose. Our lives hung in the balance, and I felt a surge of adrenaline. I managed to discreetly free my pocket knife and began sawing at the ropes. My heart pounded in my chest like a drum, every scrape of the blade against the rope echoing in my ears. Finally, the ropes gave way just as one of the men approached us. I launched myself at him, catching him off guard. We tumbled to the ground, but I managed to land a solid punch. He slumped, unconscious. The second man lunged at me. We grappled, his greater strength slowly overpowering me. But before he could land a blow, Sarah, now free, smashed a piece of broken chair against his head. He went down, and we didn't wait to see if he'd get up. We called the police from a safe distance. They arrived in droves, swarming the warehouse. We later learned the men were part of a human trafficking ring. The man from the restaurant had been using dating apps to find victims. He'd found Sarah, but thankfully, she'd found me. We never returned to online dating after that. We had found each other amidst a sea of horror, and that was enough. The experience, terrifying as it was, bonded us. And while it's a strange love story, it's ours. It's genuine, it's real, and it's far from the world of swipes and screens, in a place where we can always see the fish before it's too close. I never thought I'd be one to recite a story like this. I'm a regular guy, a software engineer, nothing interesting about me, at least until that one horrifying night. I'd been out at a local pub with friends, celebrating our successful project. The drinks flowed like a river, and before I knew it, I was stumbling back home alone, the effects of alcohol dousing my senses. My route home wasn't through the most inviting of areas. The path twisted through a neighborhood that always felt a bit off. You know, run-down buildings, abandoned playgrounds. However, it was the quickest way home, 
and I didn't fancy navigating any longer than necessary in my inebriated state. I was halfway home, my footsteps echoing in the silent street when the wind picked up. It carried a sickly sweet smell that turned my stomach. Discarded food, I reasoned. Nothing unusual for this part of town. Then I saw it. A flicker of movement in my peripheral vision. A rustling sound came from behind a building. I froze. My heart pounded in my chest. My senses heightened despite the alcohol. An alley cat, I told myself, shaking off my paranoia. Resuming my journey, I squinted into the darkness. There, on a nearby lamppost, was a tattered poster, barely hanging on. A clown advertisement for an old circus. The ink washed away with time, leaving a grotesque, almost sinister face leering back at me. I shuddered, pushing the unsettling image from my mind. A few more steps, and I heard it. A giggle, low and raspy, echoing around the vacant street. I felt a chill creep up my spine. I turned around, my eyes scanning the darkness. Nothing. Just an empty road bathed in a feeble glow from the distant streetlights. Get it together, man, I whispered to myself. The drinks must have been hitting harder than I thought. Just as I convinced myself it was my drunken imagination, I heard it again. This time, closer. My breath hitched. I stumbled back a few steps, my eyes darting from one corner of the street to the other. I wasn't alone. Across the street, under the dim light of a street lamp, I saw a figure emerge. A tall man, donning a clown suit straight out of a 60s horror flick. His face was painted white, eyes ringed with black and red smeared across his mouth in a cruel mockery of a smile. He tilted his head, staring straight at me. I blinked hoping it was just the alcohol messing with my vision. But no, when I opened my eyes, he was still there. He started to laugh, the sound echoing through the empty street, sending chills down my spine. My heart pounded in my chest like a wild drum. I turned around and started running, my fear sobering me up. Glancing back, I saw the clown was following me, his steps slow and deliberate, yet he was catching up. His laughter turned into a howl, filling the night with an eerie soundtrack. Every corner I turned, every alley I dashed through, he was there, following me. The more I ran, the louder his laughter grew, echoing in my ears. In a final desperate attempt, I bolted towards an old playground. If I could scale the fence on the other side, I'd land in a busier part of town. Maybe there, the clown wouldn't dare follow. As I ran into the playground, my foot caught on something, and I went sprawling onto the gravel. Gritting my teeth against the pain, I turned around. The clown was standing at the entrance, the streetlight casting long, threatening shadows. He held something up. My heart skipped a beat. It was my wallet. It must have fallen out during my wild sprint. You dropped this, he rasped, throwing it towards me. His laughter rang out again even as he turned and slowly walked away, disappearing into the darkness. I lay there, on the cold, hard ground, too terrified to move. After what felt like hours, I pushed myself up and grabbed my wallet. Stumbling home, I couldn't shake off the encounter. The image of that creepy clown, the sound of his laughter, it all lingered in my mind. That's my eerie run-in with a creepy clown, a nightmare that unfolded on a drunken walk home. You might say it was just a prankster having fun, but every time I hear distant laughter or see a flicker in my peripheral vision, I feel that fear creeping in, the memory of that night still haunting me. My old man, Dad, was always a creature of habit. He never used to talk much about his past. So, when he began acting out of character, it sent a chill down my spine, like the sudden cold that pricks you before the rain. It was as if he was sliding into a twilight zone of his own, a dark realm that wasn't accessible to me. That's when I started to uncover the dark truth behind a father's fears. Dad had a rigorous schedule. He would read the newspaper every morning at seven, his bifocals balanced on the bridge of his nose, cradling a hot cup of coffee. Around eight, he'd disappear into his study, surfacing only for meals or a brisk walk in the evening. But lately, he started spending less time in the study. 
more time looking out the window with a worried expression. He was... distracted. This was the first ripple in the pond of normalcy. It was a humid July night when the real oddity happened. I was awakened by the sound of shuffling feet outside my room. I peeked out to see Dad, pacing the hallway, mumbling to himself. When I asked him what he was doing, he just turned to me, his eyes filled with an unknown terror and said, They're coming. Who was coming? Dad would not say more. He retreated to his room, locking the door. The morning after, he acted as if nothing had happened. When I pressed him, he laughed it off, calling it a bad dream. But his hollow laughter echoed his discomfort, his unease. His sleepwalking episodes started becoming frequent, and he always uttered the same chilling phrase, they're coming. One afternoon, I decided to go through his study. Maybe I'd find some clue about what was plaguing him. The room was as I remembered, the same musty smell of old books and parchment, the same neat piles of work. But in the corner, I noticed a stack of papers I hadn't seen before. Among them, I found a photograph that caught my attention. It was black and white, depicting a group of stern men standing in front of a decrepit building. Dad was there too, much younger. On the back, in Dad's handwriting, it read, Project Twilight, 1983. What was this? Over the next couple of days, I combed through Dad's past, discovered connections, things that he'd never mentioned. Project Twilight was a secret government program, a psychic experiment that went awry. They'd attempted to tap into the unknown, breach the barriers between dimensions, but something had gone wrong. Something had come through. This revelation chilled me to the bone. The terror in Dad's eyes, his cryptic words, suddenly took a horrific new meaning. Whatever they had summoned during Project Twilight, was it now coming for them? Days turned into a haze of fear and anticipation. I noticed other changes in Dad. He started barricading the doors at night, his once peaceful face now marred with constant fear. He'd stopped going out for walks instead, peering out through the blinds, as if expecting something, or someone. One night, the power went out. In the unnerving darkness, I heard a soft knock on our door. Dad froze, his face as white as the moon outside. He grabbed my arm, whispered, Hide. Don't make a sound. I hid under his study table, my heart pounding as the knocking grew louder, more insistent. I heard Dad slowly unbolt the door. Then, a silence so profound that my breath felt like a deafening noise. When I finally dared to come out, the front door was wide open, swaying gently in the wind. Dad was gone. I don't know what happened to him. All that remains is an eerie silence, a testament to the dark truth behind a father's fears. And now, as I sit in his study, writing this down, I can't help but glance at the window, the weight of his fear heavy on my shoulders. Because outside, in the far distance, I see figures moving in the dark, slowly but surely they're coming. And I fear they're coming for me next. I'm a park ranger, been one for about a decade, mostly in the Pacific Northwest. You see a lot of strange things in the wilderness when you're out there enough. But this? This story? It's not just strange, it's chilling. It was a midsummer evening around 7 p.m., and I was going through the usual rounds. A family of five had just checked in, two parents and their three kids. They were going camping deep in the park, a good six-mile hike from the ranger station. They seemed well-prepared, friendly even, cracking jokes as they laced up their boots. I reminded them of the park rules and safety guidelines. Then, with a good-humored wave, they headed off into the wilderness. That was the last time I saw them, intact. The next day came and went. The family didn't return, but that wasn't uncommon. They had a seven-day pass and plenty of gear. But on the eighth day, I started to worry. By day 10, search and rescue was combing through the woods. They found the campsite on day 11, in a small clearing near a creek. The tents were pitched, sleeping bags unrolled, a cold, charred fire pit. But no sign of the family. Their boots were even neatly lined up outside the tents. 
It was as if they had vanished into thin air. The search continued. We combed miles of wilderness, every trail and potential hideaway, even used a chopper for an aerial sweep. We found no sign of them. It was as if they had been swallowed up by the forest. On day 15, something happened. I was on the late night shift, manning the station, scanning the radio channels, when a crackling sound came over the speakers. It was a voice, faint and staticky, a little girl's voice. She was crying, whimpering about being cold, being alone. I bolted upright, frantically tried to pinpoint her location. I got up, rallied two other rangers, and we followed the signal. It led us deeper into the woods, down trails barely marked on our maps. It was a grueling trek, but we followed that faint, desperate voice. We arrived at an area thick with ancient, towering trees. There was an eerie stillness, no sound of night creatures, no wind rustling the leaves. It was like stepping into another world. And there, sitting against a colossal tree, was a small figure. It was one of the girls, the youngest. She was pale, scared but miraculously alive. We rushed her back to the station, immediately called for medical aid. They said it was strange. She was dehydrated, a bit malnourished, but otherwise in decent health. Not the condition you'd expect from a child missing for over two weeks in the wilderness. She didn't say much at first. Too scared, too traumatized. Eventually though, she opened up. She said they were all asleep when they heard strange noises outside their tents. They thought it was a bear or some other wild animal. But when they unzipped the tent flap, they saw nothing. Just darkness and the cold forest air. They decided to look around, calm the kids' nerves by proving there was nothing out there. They left their boots, not wanting to take the time to lace them up. But the moment they stepped into the darkness, they were... taken... She didn't know how or by what, but one moment her family was there, and the next, they weren't. The little girl hid behind a tree, crying until she fell asleep. When she woke up, her family was gone. She spent days wandering the forest, scared, alone, until she found the radio in a discarded backpack. She didn't know where the backpack came from, just that the radio was her only hope. We never found the rest of her family. The park was closed, a thorough investigation was conducted, but nothing. They had simply vanished. We still hear their voices sometimes, faint whispers over the radio, cries for help that lead nowhere. The park reopened eventually, but things were different. Visitors were more cautious, and so were we, the rangers. The girl? She's doing okay now living with her aunt and uncle in another state. But the memory haunts her, I'm sure. The story sends a chill down my spine every time I recall it. As a ranger, you're prepared to face the wild, the unpredictable weather, even lost hikers. But this? This was something different, something inexplicable. It makes you realize we're only visitors in this wilderness. And sometimes things vanish in the wild, and they don't always come back. I'm no storyteller, but I had to get this off my chest. I still question whether the memory of that weekend is real, or if my mind played some kind of trick on me. I'm a nature guy. Every couple of months, I head out into the wild for a weekend of camping, far from any cell service. This time, I decided to explore the dense woods of Washington State. Having read a few articles on people's encounters with Bigfoot here, I was half hoping, half joking to find proof of its existence. On the first night, I was woken up by a distant tapping sound, like someone wrapping their knuckles on tree bark. I brushed it off as the work of a curious woodpecker. The next day, I hiked deeper into the woods, armed with my camera, planning to capture the serenity and untouched beauty. That afternoon, something odd happened. All the sounds of the forest went silent. No chirping birds, no rustling leaves, nothing. It was eerie. I could hear my own heartbeat. A rustling came from the bushes behind me. I spun around, half expecting a squirrel or maybe a deer. But nothing. The silence resumed. 
As I walked back to my campsite, I felt watched. I know that sounds paranoid, but you know that prickly feeling on the back of your neck? I had that. I tried shaking it off, jokingly telling myself, Come on out, Bigfoot. I promise I won't tell anyone. When I got back to camp, my tent was askew. My bag was pulled open, its contents scattered. I immediately thought a bear might have gone through my stuff, but there was no sign of torn fabric or tooth marks. In fact, everything seemed... deliberate. My camera was out of its case, placed right at the tent's entrance, lens facing out. I picked it up, skimming through the photos I'd taken earlier. As I neared the end of the album, there was a photo I didn't remember taking. It was blurry, taken during twilight. A tall, shadowy figure stood among the trees, staring directly into the lens. It was human-like, but wrong. Its limbs too long, its silhouette jagged. I felt a raw, animal fear. The idea of packing up and leaving crossed my mind, but the sun was already setting, and wandering the woods at night was risky. Night fell, and with it the temperature. I started a campfire, the flames casting dancing shadows around. The forest noises resumed, but they felt... off. Like an orchestra missing a few key instruments. I was reluctant to sleep, but eventually, exhaustion took over. Hours into the night, I was jolted awake by that same tapping from the previous night, but now it was closer. Louder. My heart thudded against my ribcage. I lay frozen in my sleeping bag, straining my ears. A soft thud followed the tapping, then another. They were footsteps. Something was walking around my campsite. Every instinct screamed to stay silent, to not draw attention. I held my breath as the steps moved closer, circling my tent. The fabric of my tent creaked, as if someone, or something, was pressing against it, trying to see in. I didn't want to see what was outside, but I needed to know. Quietly, I fumbled for my camera, switching to video mode. I angled it towards the tent's entrance, praying it'd capture something. For what felt like hours, I lay there, paralyzed by fear. The footsteps eventually receded, replaced by the familiar sounds of the forest. Come morning, I packed up with haste, desperate to get out. I didn't stop until I reached my car. On the drive home, I mustered the courage to check the video. At first, it was just the subtle sounds of the night. But around the two-minute mark, the tent's fabric was pushed inward, revealing a large eye. Not human, not animal, but somewhere unsettlingly in between. It peered in for a few moments before retreating. The last few seconds were the worst. The camera seemed to adjust to the darkness outside, capturing a brief glimpse of that tall, twisted silhouette, watching, waiting. I've shared my story with a few close friends and they all have theories. Most just think it's some elaborate prank or maybe a reclusive hermit messing with me. But deep down, I know what I saw wasn't human. I've since tried to debunk it, to find logical explanations. Yet, at the back of my mind, a chilling thought persists. I wanted evidence of Bigfoot, and maybe, just maybe, I got my wish. Be careful what you wish for. It might be out there, watching, waiting to be found. Or worse, waiting for you. I never thought I'd be the kind of person to share one of these real-life horror stories online. But what happened to me last month? Man, I can't shake it. I got a new job in a different city and was apartment hunting. Most of the options were way out of my budget. So, when I found this older, one-bedroom spot at a fraction of the price of the others, I pounced on it. It was at the edge of the city, in one of those neighborhoods that's quiet, but not abandoned quiet. You know the type. My first night as I was unpacking, I noticed this odd painting in the hallway. It depicted a crowded marketplace, and right in the middle was a man in a dark coat facing away. Just an ordinary painting, but there was something about that man. His stance or the way the artist had shaded him. It felt... off. But, you know, free artwork. The nights began blurring together, and things... shifted. I'd wake up to find kitchen cabinets open or my shoes in a different place. I chalked it up to tiredness and stress. One evening, I was lounging on the couch, a podcast playing in the background. 
It was one of those deep dives into urban legends. The host began discussing an old tale of the Market Watcher, a figure said to appear in artworks, always facing away, always watching. It was believed that if you owned such an art piece, strange occurrences would plague your life. I laughed, thinking of the painting in the hall. But then, I started recalling all the minor oddities. Displaced shoes, open cabinets. I got up, compelled to check the painting. There it was, the same crowded market. But something had changed. The man in the coat seemed slightly turned, as if he'd shifted his weight. Dismissing my paranoia, I decided to take the painting down anyway. The next morning, I almost jumped out of my skin. The painting was back up on the wall. And the man? He was even more turned towards the viewer. Not much, but enough to see the outline of a face. A face that seemed... familiar. I did the logical thing. Threw the painting out. I wish it had ended there. Two days later, I found it in the hallway again. The man was now glaring directly at me. Panicking, I drove it to a dump, ensuring I watched as they crushed it. But that night, I heard soft whispering outside my bedroom. When I opened the door, the painting lay there, the marketplace scene now void of people, except the man. He stood closer, his face clearly visible. It was my face. From then on, it was a cat and mouse game. I'd burn, destroy, or discard the painting, but it always returned. And every time the figure inched closer, growing in size, his expression turning from anger to hunger. I consulted experts. One elderly art curator mentioned tales from his grandfather about paintings cursed to trap souls, with the market watcher as the gatekeeper. Each soul absorbed would leave the canvas, making room for a new one. Terrified, I tried everything. Blessings, seals, even a psychic who urged me to leave the apartment. But the painting? It followed me everywhere. In desperation, I recalled a childhood trick. Mirrors deflect bad energy. Might sound stupid, but I was out of options. I bought a large mirror, placing the painting face to face with it in a locked room. That night was the quietest I'd had in weeks. Morning came, and with trepidation, I opened the locked door. The painting was as I'd left it, but the scene had changed once again. The market was back, buzzing with activity. And the man? He was in the far distance, almost out of sight. But the mirror? I still shiver thinking about it. There, reflecting the scene was the marketplace too, but with one addition. In the very center stood a man, facing away, wearing the coat I'd thrown out the night before. I left the apartment that day, leaving everything behind. The whispering, the man, that relentless painting. I'm in a new place now. There are no paintings here, just bare walls. But mirrors? They're everywhere. Last night I could have sworn I saw, in the dim light, a marketplace scene forming in one of them. And from the corner of my eye, I thought I glimpsed a figure, just on the edge of the reflection, in a familiar dark coat, beginning to turn. Last summer, my friends and I decided to spend our vacation at an old cabin in the secluded woods of Colorado. It was supposed to be a fun-filled adventure, an escape from our bustling city life. Little did we know, it would turn into something we'd never forget. The cabin belonged to my Uncle Rick, who was more than happy to lend it to us. He gave us only one rule, don't venture too far into the woods at night. We laughed it off, thinking it was just an old man's silly warning. We drove up to the cabin on a Friday afternoon. Nestled in the lush greenery, the cabin looked welcoming, a perfect rustic retreat. The sun was setting when we finished unloading, painting the sky in hues of orange and red. As the light dimmed, a hush fell over the woods. It was peaceful, but there was something eerie about the silence. After dinner, we settled down around the fireplace, sharing stories and laughter. Then, Jason, the jokester of our group, suggested a night hike in the woods. Remembering my uncle's warning, I was apprehensive, but peer pressure and the thrill of adventure got the best of me. Armed with flashlights, we ventured into the dark woods, leaving the warm glow of the cabin behind. The further we went, 
the more the atmosphere changed. The woods seemed to close in on us, and the silence was punctuated by unfamiliar nocturnal sounds. My heart pounded as the sense of unease grew. We were about half a mile in when I noticed it. Something was off. I could see the flashlights bouncing off in front, but there were... extra shadows. Dark figures that didn't match up with our movements. My blood turned cold. Guys, do you see that? I whispered, pointing at the odd shadows. They all turned to look and the joking ceased. Our laughter was replaced by a chilling silence. The figures were human-like, tall and lean, swaying as if watching us. We stood still, unable to comprehend what we were seeing. Sarah, the bravest among us, decided to approach them, thinking they might be fellow hikers. As she stepped forward, the figures receded deeper into the darkness. Intrigued, she followed, and we, more anxious than ever, trailed behind. Suddenly, Sarah stopped dead in her tracks, her flashlight dropping to the ground. In the faint beam, we could see her face, pale and horrified. She was staring at something. We turned our flashlights to where she was looking, and we saw them. Three dark, towering figures, standing unnaturally still just a few yards away. Their edges seemed to blur into the surrounding darkness, making it impossible to discern their exact form. But their presence was undeniable and terrifying. We stood frozen in fear, flashlights aimed at the figures, unable to move or even scream. One of them then started to approach us. Its movement was slow and distorted, as if it was struggling against the darkness itself. The terror was overwhelming, and it was then we found our legs. We turned and ran. The woods were a terrifying maze as we sprinted back towards the cabin, the dark figures seeming to follow us. We didn't dare look back. We could feel their presence, like a tangible shadow casting over us. When we finally burst into the cabin, we locked the door behind us, panting and trembling. We spent the rest of the night in terrified silence, jumping at the smallest of sounds. None of us slept. At first light, we packed our things and left the cabin, not even daring to look back. Back in the city, we tried to rationalize the experience, attributing it to our collective fear and the dark playing tricks on us. But deep down, we knew what we saw was real. Those figures were there, in the woods, and they were unlike anything we'd ever seen. Now when I think of that cabin, the laughter and the adventure, they're overshadowed by the terrifying memory of the dark figures we encountered. It's a memory that still sends shivers down my spine. Uncle Rick's warning wasn't just an old man's silly caution. It was real, based on something he must have known or experienced. So here's my advice. If you ever find yourself in a secluded cabin in the woods, heed the warnings you're given. Don't venture out into the darkness, because you never know what might be waiting for you there. About five months ago, I found a young man probably no older than 20 in my backyard. He was just laid out on the ground, asleep, as if someone had placed him there. I ran to him immediately. Hey, are you all right? I got down beside him and looked him over for any visible injuries, but found none. I shook him, and he stirred, squinting his eyes. He looked around before his gaze landed on me. I immediately froze. I felt like I was being stared down by a predator. The only way I can describe my fear is as instinctive, the primal reflex of fight or flight. I froze under the gaze and was barely able to say anything. H hey, are you all right? You were laid out in my backyard, I asked, stuttering over my words. He blinked, and the deadly glint in his eyes disappeared. Yes, I'm all right. Did you say that I'm in your backyard? That's right, I responded, relieved. Do you know how you got here? He sat up. I... I don't know. I can't remember anything. That's all right. What about your name? Can you tell me your name? Charlie. I'm pretty sure my name is Charlie. He hesitantly answered. I smiled. Okay, Charlie. My name is Vanessa. Would you like me to take you to the hospital? No, I'm fine, Charlie said, shaking his head. Are you sure? I don't mind taking you, I asked, concerned. He smiled. I'm sure, but thank you, Vanessa. Can you instead help me up? 
I nodded, grabbing his arm and supporting him as he stood up. He seemed to be a little uneasy on his feet, so I held on to him and led him into my house. I sat him down at my kitchen table and got him a glass of water. Thank you, he said, taking the water from me. Charlie, do you remember anything from before you ended up here? He fell silent as he scrunched his face up, no doubt thinking. I... I think I was hiking in the woods, but I honestly don't know. I can't really remember anything. I nodded. I see. Well, Charlie, let's go to the police. Someone who knows you might have filed a missing persons report. And even if they didn't, the police should have you in their database. He agreed. And before long, we were on the road headed to the police station. Arriving at the station, I informed the police of the situation. After running a check, they said there weren't any missing persons reports for Charlie. They then ran a check for him through their databases, but they came up with nothing. Feeling stumped, they fingerprinted him in hopes that it was just a glitch in their system. All right, ma'am. It'll take three to five business days to get his background check back. If you will, please sign your name here along with your phone number so we can call you when we get the results, the officer said. Okay. I responded as I signed the form. After leaving the police station, I headed towards the store, earning a confused look from Charlie. You have no memory. I can't just leave you on the street. You can stay with me until we get the results from your fingerprint background check, I said. Thank you, Vanessa. I appreciate your kindness. And so I got some more food, snacks, and anything else Charlie would need. Charlie and I waited day in and day out for a phone call. And finally, on the fifth business day, I received a call from the police station. I'm sorry, but can you repeat that, officer? I said, in disbelief of what I heard. Ma'am, I don't know how that man ended up in your backyard or where he came from, but we had nothing on him when we ran a background check. In the eyes of the government, he is a ghost, a phantom that never existed. Now this could just be a bug in their system, but I suggest you be careful around him. We will try and fix this if it is just a bug and then get back to you. Till then, take care, he said, crunching away on something. Did he not care about the situation I'm now in? Charlie had just come in from a run and must have seen my confused face because his own face became that of worry. Vanessa, is something wrong? I shook my head. According to the background check they ran, you don't exist, Charlie. They have nothing on you, not even a birth certificate. Shock marred his face, and he quickly sat down. I must be confused. How can I not exist? I mean, he scoffed. I'm right here, living, breathing, shouting. His anger turned to worry. What does this mean? Should I worry? Am I going to jail or something? Don't worry too much. The officer said this could be a glitch in their system. He'll get back with me at a later time if they do find anything. So try not to worry too much, all right? I tried to assure him. He sighed and gave me a small smile before heading off to his room that I had prepared for him just days prior. I had told him not to worry, but weeks passed and we still heard nothing back. Charlie and I were both concerned. As my worries grew, time and time again I found myself coming back to that day we met. That look in his eyes when his gaze had fallen upon me still sends shivers down my spine. About three months had passed, and Charlie and I had grown quite close. He had become a close friend of mine, someone I could talk to without concealment. It made it easy to talk about my worries and past when Charlie showed such an extreme interest. He'd always listen happily when I told him about some of the things I did as a teenager. He'd try to give me advice when I told him my fears or apprehensions. But it wasn't until I mentioned my ex-husband that the murderous glint came back to his eyes. Because of this, I never mentioned my ex-husband again, and Charlie continued on as normal. Things were great, and Charlie had even gotten a job at a fast food restaurant as a way to help out around the house and to pay the bills as well. Everything was fine. A few weeks ago, I had just gotten home from work and Charlie was already home as he had the day off. I came in, and he greeted me as usual. I went to get changed into some comfortable clothes. I had just come back into the living room when I heard loud banging on the door. This alerted Charlie, and he was about to get the door, but I reached the door before him. 
I looked through the peak hole and saw my ex-husband, Jim. With a sigh, I opened the door and crossed my arms. What do you want, Jim? You know you can't be here, I said. The hell I can't. Why haven't you been responding to my text messages and calls? If we talked about this, I'm sure you'd change your mind. He yelled in a pleading manner. I rolled my eyes at his act. It's too late, Jim. I finalized the divorce papers a few days ago. You know I have a restraining order against you, so if you don't leave, I will call the police. By this point, Charlie had come into Jim's view, which caused Jim to fly into a fury. Is this the reason you divorced me? So you could play it up with some other guy? He yelled. I stepped back a bit and started shaking. No, I divorced you because you are an abusive asshole. Now leave before I call the cops. Oh, so you want to call the cops now, do you? He said, laughing a bit. Fine. I'll give you a reason to call them. He raised his fist and went to swing, and in an instant, he was sliced into multiple pieces. I stood there shaking, soaked in his blood. I was frozen, unable to move, but slowly looked down at what used to be my ex-husband. Now he resembled that of chopped up beef. I felt my stomach begin to churn before I vomited what I had eaten for lunch. What happened to him? What could have done this? It was then that I felt something was wrong as Charlie hadn't said anything or moved. I slowly turned to see Charlie standing there, with an emotionless look on his face. I looked into his eyes and no longer saw a human. No, I saw something worse, something more evil than anything I had ever seen. I focused my eyes on Charlie's hands which were drenched in blood. He continued to stare at the bloody mess on my front porch. I made the mistake of gasping and his inhuman eyes were now turned to me. Just like before, he blinked, and that evil hatred was gone. Vanessa, are you alright? He asked, coming towards me. I threw my hands up. D don't come near me! He stopped short and simply stared at me with a look of concern on his face. V, Vanessa, I don't understand. Why are you scared? Why won't you let me come near you? I could only place my head in my hands as I tried to process what happened. Charlie clearly had something to do with what happened to Jim, but how? I didn't even see him move, but yet his hands are drenched in blood. S Charlie, what did, did you do? I asked, my voice quivering. I could feel my knees trying to give out from beneath me, and I had to lean against the door to hold myself up. He looked confused for a moment before responding. Ah, you mean that. Well, he was going to hit you, so I prevented him from doing so. How could he answer so nonchalantly as if he didn't just kill someone? No, Charlie, you c killed him, I said, and I immediately clamped my mouth shut in fear I'd be next. I don't understand. I thought you'd be happy with him dead. Was I wrong for what I did? He asked almost with a face of innocence. How could he ask something like that? It's like he has no understanding of what's right and what's wrong. What t the hell are you? Just, huh, how did you slice him into pea pieces? I asked, completely overtaken by fear. He cocked his head to the side. What do you mean? I'm Charlie. Did you already forget? And as for him? Well, it's not hard to slice a human up as if you are cutting tofu. I needed to call the police. I went to move towards my phone but slipped on a piece of flesh. I was about to fall but Charlie caught me immediately. It's all right now, Vanessa, he said, stroking my head. Jim can't hurt you anymore. I won't let anyone hurt you. He didn't say it, but I knew what he meant. He might not kill me, but if I called the cops, he'd kill them in front of me just like what he did to Jim. I nodded as tears fell from my eyes. I needed to keep him happy, so I let him continue to hug me. My body shook from both fear and disgust. S Charlie... I can't have that on m my front peak porch. Can... can you c clean it you up? I asked. Of course, Vanessa, just leave it to me. I'll make sure there isn't a trace of blood or flesh left. He replied happily. I nodded. I need to get cleaned you up, so I'm going to get a shower. Before I could leave, Charlie grabbed me by the wrist. You won't leave me, will you? Oh, of course not. I'm n not going to l leave you. I'm j just a little... Frightened from what happened, I answered. He said nothing more but let go of my wrist. I must have stayed in the shower for an hour, 
crying while I cleaned the blood from my skin and hair. I couldn't stop trembling and dreaded having to go back out and see that thing. The water had turned cold, and I finally got out, getting changed into some clothes. I walked back out into the living room and Charlie was sitting on the couch watching TV. I looked to the front door, and it looked as if nothing had ever happened. Charlie, did you, you take care of Ayat? I asked, making sure I didn't imagine everything that happened. He looked at me and smiled. Of course, I cleaned Jim up and threw his pieces into the woods. I felt relief that I wasn't crazy and imagined everything, but I felt even more scared by how he answered. I merely nodded and walked to the kitchen. As I said, that was a few weeks ago, and I've been trying to ensure that I don't do anything that Charlie would dislike. He has continued on with life as if nothing had happened. He goes to work like normal, speaks with me like normal, and goes to see friends like normal. It would almost make anyone think that they imagined it, but I know I didn't because a few days later there was a missing persons report for Jim. I honestly don't know what I should do. I am sharing the same roof with something that could easily kill me. Not to mention he goes with me when I go see my family or friends whenever he has the free time to do so. I try to act like everything is normal, but I'm afraid that Charlie might kill them if they make him angry. That is why I am taking the risk and posting this here. Could someone, anyone, tell me what Charlie is and how I can get away from him? Please, help me. I'm begging you. I'm a trucker. I've been one for about 20 years now, traveling cross-country, delivering loads and soaking up the sprawling beauty of the American landscape. Never once did I experience anything that I couldn't explain, until that fateful night in Nebraska. I had a delivery that would take me through the Cornhusker State, an easy overnight haul that I'd done countless times before. I remember the radio crackling with country music as the sun set, drenching the far-off cornfields in hues of red and orange. The transition from day to night was slow, but soon enough, I was driving under a moonless sky, nothing but the stark beam from my headlights illuminating the endless road ahead. Suddenly, my CB radio squawked to life, cutting through the silence of the cab. It was another trucker, voice shaky, warning about a detour up ahead. Bridge out. I thanked him and adjusted my route, preparing to navigate through some of the smaller, less familiar country roads. I wasn't thrilled, but it was part of the job. Driving down those desolate roads, the only light came from my truck. No moon, no stars, just an eerily calm, inky darkness. Suddenly, out of nowhere, my headlights caught a flash of something metallic on the side of the road. I hit the brakes and squinted through the windshield. It was a silver Airstream trailer, parked haphazardly in a makeshift gravel pull-off. That wasn't uncommon. Lots of folks camped out on these roads. What was strange, however, was the complete lack of light or life around it. It was just sitting there, an alien object dropped into an ocean of darkness. Something felt off. But shrugging off the unease, I continued on, convincing myself that it was just a couple of campers settling in for the night. After another hour of driving, my eyes began to play tricks on me. The road seemed to shift and blur, and I knew it was time for a break. I spotted another gravel pull-off ahead and decided to rest. Pulling in, my headlights again glinted off a familiar metallic surface. It was the same silver airstream, parked just like before. A chill ran down my spine. There was no way this was the same trailer. I must have been more tired than I thought. I quickly parked the rig and climbed into the sleeper berth, but sleep didn't come easy. I kept glancing at the airstream, its silver shell glowing faintly under my parking lights. The stillness was unnerving, the silence so thick it felt like a presence. Finally, I must have drifted off, because the next thing I remember was waking up to a soft tap-tap-tap on the side of my cab. My eyes shot open, heart pounding. It was too rhythmic to be the wind or a branch. Somebody was out there. I carefully peered through the window, but it was pitch black outside. The tapping continued, a constant reminder of the unwelcome presence in the darkness. Gathering my courage, I decided to face it. Sliding on my boots, I grabbed my flashlight and slowly opened the cab door. The ground crunched under my weight as I descended. I flicked on the flashlight and scanned the area. 
The beam of light caught the side of the airstream. It was closer now. My breath hitched as the tapping sound shifted, moving around the side of my truck. I followed the sound, my flashlight trembling in my hand. As I rounded the back of the truck, the light caught something crouched low by my rear tires. I froze. It was a woman, her back turned to me, dressed in a faded floral dress. Her long, unkempt hair fell over her face as she continued tapping on my tires. Ma'am? I stammered, but she didn't react. My heart pounded in my chest as I took a step forward, repeating louder. Ma'am, you all right? Then she stopped. The silence was suffocating. Slowly, she began to turn. I held my breath. Her face came into view, but there was nothing where her eyes should have been. Just two empty, dark sockets. I stumbled back in horror, my flashlight slipping from my hands, plunging the world into darkness. Next thing I remember, I was in my cab, my rig roaring down the road, the silver airstream shrinking in my rearview mirror. I drove until the sun came up, my heart still pounding, the woman's face forever etched in my mind. Now, I avoid that road in Nebraska. I've never told anyone this story before, not my dispatcher, not my fellow truckers. They'd think I was crazy. I sometimes wonder if it was just a nightmare, a trick played by an overtired mind. But every time I close my eyes, I can still hear that tap, tap, tap. And the memory of that woman with the empty eyes makes my blood run cold. It started like any other late summer evening in our sleepy southern town, where our biggest attraction is the weathered stone structure that has served as our church for more than a century. I had just shut off my bedside lamp and snuggled under my quilt when I heard the first sound. It wasn't loud, just a faint whimper carried on the gentle breeze, almost lost in the nighttime chorus of crickets. But it was there, a sound that didn't belong, a scream. I sat up, blinking at the darkness. There it was again, a distant, ghostly cry. A chill prickled my skin. The noise was coming from the direction of the church. I grabbed my phone, checked the time, midnight. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to brush off the unnerving coincidence. Curiosity tugged me from the warmth of my bed. I lived alone in my little farmhouse, the nearest neighbor half a mile away, and the church just beyond the hill in front of my house. Despite the chill night air, I padded outside in my pajamas, hoping to debunk the eerie late-night screams as a misheard wind or maybe a distressed animal. As I got closer to the church, the screams became clearer, louder. They echoed off the crumbling stone walls and echoed in the still night air. It was a human voice, a woman's voice. Sweat dripped down my brow. The scream, now unmistakable, carried a raw terror that twisted my stomach. I fumbled with my phone, dialed the sheriff, and waited, my gaze locked on the dark silhouette of the church against the starry sky. But as the phone rang, the screaming stopped. The sudden silence was just as unsettling. Hello? I said, relief washing over me as Sheriff Daniels answered. I explained what I'd heard, and his tone turned serious. He promised to send a patrol car to check it out, and told me to go back home and lock the doors. But curiosity compelled me to stay. I waited behind a gnarled old oak tree, shivering as a cold wind rustled the leaves overhead. The quiet was deafening, the occasional hoot of an owl or rustle of dry grass the only sound. Then the church bell began to toll, the ominous sound vibrating through the air and in my bones. I froze. The bell never rang at this hour. I counted, 12 strokes. The patrol car's lights appeared on the horizon and I breathed a sigh of relief. But the relief was short-lived. As the car pulled up, a figure darted from the shadows of the church, disappearing into the woods. There was another scream, this time a man's, Deputy Turner's. I heard a gunshot, a yelp, and then silence again. I edged forward, the beam of my phone's flashlight leading the way. Turner was slumped against the patrol car, unconscious or worse. I dialed the sheriff again, my hands shaking so badly I almost dropped the phone. His voice, this time panicked, instructed me to stay put and wait for backup. But the ominous silence from the church drew me in. 
the heavy wooden door creaked open, revealing a dimly lit interior. Candles flickered on the altar, their glow casting long, menacing shadows. That's when I saw her, a figure in a flowing white gown, standing in front of the pulpit. She turned towards me, and I froze. Her eyes were vacant, lost. She began to sing an unfamiliar hymn in a haunting, ethereal voice. Who are you? I managed to stammer, my voice shaking. She smiled, a sorrowful, chilling smile. I am the one who waits, she said, her voice barely a whisper. There was a sharp, piercing wail, a last cry from some lost soul. And then, she was gone. The next thing I remember was Sheriff Daniels shaking me awake in the morning light. I was outside the church, and Deputy Turner was being loaded into an ambulance, alive but shaken. The church was as quiet and serene as always. To this day, no one knows what happened that night. No one believes my story. They said it was a figment of my imagination, a trick played by the night. But I know what I saw, what I heard. I don't attend Sunday services anymore. I can't. Because every time I look at that church, I see her. And every midnight, if I listen closely, I can still hear her scream.